Janet Letnus Martin and Al Todnam are authors of the Lutheran Church Basement Women. Yes, that's correct. People here in Minnesota know how to keep it brief. Um, thank you very much. I may be the first book award winner to do this, but thank you to my sheep. Tonight I considered myself just a hack journalist, and now I guess the award-winning literati. <laughs> you would think, uh, since I found out in January that I got the award, that I'd be all prepared with a speech, but I just wrote it now. <laughs> a little more prepared than Charles Baxter, but not much. Here's a little tiny poem of mine that uh, was written after an experience that I'm sure many of you writers, all of you writers have had, where someone takes some little something that you have written, takes it to heart, twirls it around and gets completely the wrong meaning from it. Stories do not only belong to those who've lived through them, they belong to those who share in them. I'm so proud to stand here today as a Minnesotan writer with the force of Minnesota behind me because in the last year I've discovered for a whole community that it is possible. Our daughter Carrie. For years, Carrie has opened my rejection letters as part of her after-school rituals. For the dozens or so people that came up to me to congratulate me for winning the Kay Sexton Award this evening. <laughs> Seriously, people, I, I know you like books, but pick up a newspaper every once in a while. It's okay. With this very select group of finalists in memoir and creative nonfiction, otherwise known as, but enough about me, what do you think about me, category. Have you any idea how exciting it is to get to my age and write your first book, and then to discover that wonderful staff at the Historical Society Press, and then to have you all make a fuss about me? <laughs> Poetry is kind of like the crazy aunt of the literary family. <clears throat> or the drunk, or depending on the family, coked out meth head uncle. My dad um, wrote a hundred limericks once and hid them in my bedroom. And it made me think poetry may have some use. <laughs> I had to clean up the whole room to get to them. I got a letter a couple of weeks ago from a sixth grader who wrote in part, quote, I love your books. I talk about them all the time, but no one knows you. <laughs> I thought that was pretty accurate. I am the writer about whom Garrison Keillor once said, uh, my idea of death would be to be stuck in a cabin in the North Woods for two weeks with nothing to read but Paul Gruco's books. <laughs> People of the book, I salute you. What we have is literature. And is heavy enough to be a blunt instrument. <laughs> What's on television is really insane and it's gonna get worse. So the only thing you can do, really, is to learn how to write a poem, learn how to paint a painting, learn how to make some music, so you can bring your own madness up to meet the madness there. So the stanza says, the hermit says, because the world is mad, 
The only way through it is to learn the arts and double the madness. Are you listening? We are a city and a state that values literacy. We value our authors and we have to make sure that we honor them in the highest and best fashion. And I think we do that here tonight. I'm astonished and really happy to see this, this sizable turnout here. It's, it's just amazing. It proves what Jack Weatherford said. What a great place this is to write and to read. That's the thing about Minnesota is you can think of yourself as a writer here. Certainly I could. I've been involved in literary communities for 25 years all over the country and uh, I judged book awards in different states and believe me I've never seen anything as what I see in Minnesota. I am so proud to be from a state that honors, values, and supports its artists. I want you to know George isn't off somewhere speaking to some august body. He's not at the movies. He's not watching TV, he doesn't own one. He's too damn nervous to come. <laughs> this award really means a lot to him. Of the making of books, there is no end from Ecclesiastes. All I can say is thank you very much. I needed it. <laughs> so much Minnesota Book Awards. I am just thrilled to be here. Uh, when they asked me to MC, I said I would love to, but under certain conditions. And those conditions are, number one, that the St. Paul Friends of the Library waive all and future library book finds of mine. <laughs> I know it did cut into the budget a little. Also, number two, that the Highland Park branch expunge from my permanent record all evidence that I ever checked out Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> um, but I'm just, I am so happy to be here for the 25th anniversary party. And I want tonight, yeah. I want tonight to be a big celebration. I want us to celebrate ourselves, to toast ourselves, and I know that's hard because we're Minnesotans. Um, my own Norwegian grandmother once asked me how I was doing, and I said, great, and she said, but tonight I want it to be a night of tooting. Toot, toot, toot. Let's toot our own horns because I do think we have the best literary community in the United States. I really, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yes, I really do want us to get a little rowdy tonight. Um, you know, I'm not asking for a drunken brawl, you know. This, after all, is not a loft board meeting. Um, but you know, if, if a poet in the crowd wants to jump up on a table and recite Allen Ginsberg's Howl, feel free. And you know, parties, they're always good for romance and intrigue, so maybe we'll get some cross-genre coupling tonight. Ooh. And you look so festive, you look like partiers. Oh, also... I've got a lot of these, and, and I encourage anyone who comes up on this stage, because you've already made literary noise, to make some party noise. So I want some party poppers popped tonight. And if you're still feeling a little shy and don't really yet know how to party, I am now initiating a drinking game. And every time you hear the word book, I want you to take a sip, okay? Yeah, 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 that should get the party machine rolling. So, on with the show. Oh man, I hope that's not high def. Oh, um. Tonight is special, not only because of the work being celebrated, but it's the culmination of the 25th anniversary year of Minnesota Book Awards. Yay! Woo! 
book, book, book. Okay. So on to tonight's honorees. Woohoo! You know, there were 256 nominations for the eight category awards being presented tonight, in addition to two special awards. Previous Minnesota Book Award winners are here to present the honors, which include a hand-blown glass award by St. Paul artist Dick Huss. Okay, the novel and short story category. This category is sponsored by Education Minnesota, the state's educators union, representing 70,000 professionals working together for excellence in education for all students. Education Minnesota's members include teachers and educational support professionals in Minnesota's public school districts, faculty members at Minnesota's community and technical colleges, and the University of Minnesota campuses in Duluth and Crookston, plus retired educators and student teachers. Please join me in recognizing Education Minnesota and their governing board. What would we do without our educators? Now, our four finalists in the novel and short story range from debut authors to veteran award winners and include two collections of short stories and two novels. Joining us to present the award is the 2012 winner for The Law of Miracles and Other Stories, Gregory Blake Smith. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you all for coming tonight. When I was young and trying to learn how to put one sentence after another, I supported myself, or semi-supported myself, by substitute teaching in an elementary school. Not only was this a job you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy, I was a teacher you wouldn't wish on the children of your worst enemy. But whatever the traumas of the day, when story time came around, I found I had magic in my hands. The hyperactive kid in the Godzilla shirt, the dazed dreamer, the kid who liked to accidentally fall off his chair over and over. As soon as I opened up a storybook, they were mine. That power of storytelling to cast its spell over us is shared by this year's finalists. For whatever their difference of style and setting, and they are different, ranging from a southern plantation to a North Dakota reservation to Russia and small town Minnesota. These four books of fiction each possesses the power to enchant, to take us out of our Godzilla shirts and remind us of the mystery and awe and sometimes the horror of what it means to be human. Here are this year's finalists. Please hold your applause until all are announced. The Healing by Jonathan O'Dell, published by Nan A. Talese Random House. It Takes You Over by Nick Healy, published by New Rivers Press. The Roundhouse by Louise Erdrich, published by Harper Harper Collins. And Vladimir's Mustache and Other Stories by Stefan Eric Clark, published by Russian Life Books. And the award goes to... Louise Erdrich for the Round House. hugging her? Everybody noticed my legs while I was hugging her? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, once the, um, well, you know, once, once the, the face goes, you've got to emphasize the legs. That's how it works. I, I heard it from, you know, Zsa, Zsa Gabor. I don't know what is going on. I have a speech here that I was going to read, but Lord, when Lorna started the party book, the party book. When she started this, it totally changed my outlook 
and also, um, I have a 12-year-old daughter, and this is a huge chance to embarrass her, and she's in the audience. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was going to start this in Ojibwe. Anin nindinawe bagani dok apijigo miigwichginawa. Thank you all. It really, uh, it's, this is a terrific party. There's nothing like this. This is wonderful. Um, I, the, the buzz, the feel, the excitement, everything, and the, the sponsorship. Um, I want to thank Marvin Windows first for not laying off anyone during the recession. <laughs> and every, every, everyone who worked on this, and also the education, uh, the, oh my god. Uh, thank you. My, I was, I'm, I'm so glad that you're sponsoring this award. My father um, is and was a school teacher. We were raised mother and father school teachers, and it's a, it's a very special way to grow up. Um, for instance, when my father was bored at, at, at work during you know, those committee meetings, he would, he would make up um, limericks. And so I thought, um, as I was sitting there, I thought, in honor of him, I'll recite my favorite limerick, he wrote one for every town in North Dakota. <laughs> there once was a girl from Max Bass. She had the most beautiful ass. <laughs> Twas not what you think. Twas not round and pink, but was gray and braid and ate grass. <laughs> uh, book, okay. Uh, Dan, thank you so, so very much for supporting me during the writing of this book. This is my husband. Um, your fishing license renewal came in the mail today. Um, uh, he, he's from South Dakota, so he's really brutally honest. And um, sometimes I'll, he'll read a book and he'll go, it's not even in the top five. You know, it's not in your, but this one he said it is. It is. And um, I, no, I really, I, I thank you. You've been, you've been um, heart and joy, and I, I, I don't think I even deserve how much, how much you've done for me in the writing of this book. And likewise, my daughter Gige, who is also here. Gige, when I was writing this book, sometimes things were very hard and very tough, and your smile, your hugs, and your good cheer got me through so many of those times. So thank you, and thank you all. It's a beautiful celebration. Thanks. Oh, God. This is a beauty. No, no, no. Get away. What? Take your popper. What do I do? You just pull the string. She's got a popper popper. <laughs> Go! There you go. All right. I love that. Yeah. Wow. And here's for Louise winning the National Book Award. Yeah. The four winner, winners, sorry, you're all winners. Thank you. The four writers in books that comprise the finalists for the Minnesota category all examine lives and ways of living that help us plumb the depths of our state history and shared culture. The Minnesota category is sponsored by Mayor Schur and Rock Castle, an award-winning architecture and interior design firm known for both designing exceptional new spaces and through preservation, adaptive reuse, and renovation, discovering innovative ways to reuse buildings, like the Open Book Center. The firm is a national leader in library design, having worked on more than 10.5 million square feet of library space for clients across the country. Please join me in recognizing Mayor Schur and Rock Castle. Yeah.
And here to present the award is the Minnesota Book Award winner for 2012 for Pioneering Modernists, Minnesota's first generation of women artists, Julie L'Enfant. Minnesota is my adoptive home. One of the most impressive things about the state, apart from the weather, of course, <laughs> is its appreciation for its history. The Minnesota Historical Society and county societies throughout the state are marvelous starting places for writers' research. This year, many new books have been written about Minnesota's diverse culture, past and present. The four finalists in the Minnesota category are Every Man Did His Duty, Pictures and Stories of the Men of the First Minnesota by Wayne D. Jorgensen, published by Tesora Books. Lost Duluth, Landmarks, Industries, Buildings, Homes, and the Neighborhoods in Which They Stood by Tony Deerkins and Mary Ann C. Norton, published by Zenith City Press, Excommunication. The Minnesota Book of Skills, Your Guide to Smoking Whitefish, Sauna Etiquette, Tick Extraction, and More by Chris Niskanen, Niskanen, published by Minnesota Historical Society Press, and Minnesota Makochi, The Land of the Dakota by Gwen Westerman and Bruce White published by Minnesota Historical Society Press. The award goes to Gwen Westerman and Bruce White. <laughs> Minnesota Makochi, the land of the Dakota. Minnesota Makoche Unkitawapi Atea Dakota Iapi Ka Hena Oheni Unkiksuyapi Minnesota is our homeland and Dakota is spoken here and we will always remember that. email said we only had one minute each. <laughs> so the people at Table 29 are part of our collaborative research team, Howard Vogel, Kate Bean, our daughter Erin Griffin, my husband Glenn Washichina, and without this incredible group of people, uh, this book wouldn't have come to be. So Nina Wopida. It's, it's hard to write a speech when you know you might not have to give it. <laughs> and so it, this is, a, this is an, a surprise and an honor. And I think it's an honor for the Dakota people, for the grandmothers and grandfathers, the people who were sent into exile in 1863. And, and I want to remember the grandmothers and grandfathers, and I want to remember Kate Bean's grandmother, Lillian Bean, who passed away only a few days ago. The Bean family, one might say they invented our project. William Bean and Sid Bean and Kate Bean who worked with us. And we, we had a, a long and productive time working together, sitting around round tables like that one and arguing about things and to me it was a great education in the history of the Dakota people in this place that was their homeland and so I truly came to understand and appreciate the sentence that that's appears at the beginning of the book, Minnesota is the Dakota place. 
Thank you. Boy, I could listen to your stories for all night. So uh, let's just get rid of that one minute uh, time limit and make it an hour, okay? <laughs> Everybody's got an hour each because you're storytellers. Our third category award is for young people's literature, comprised of three writers new to the book awards and a returning finalist. This category is sponsored by SIT Investment Associates, a full product global asset manager with expertise in domestic and international equities and fixed income products. Let's recognize SIT Investment Associates. Thank you. Here you are. And here to present the award in young people's literature is last year's winner for With or Without You, Brian Ferry Lutz. <clears throat> when I'm not tapping my fingers on the keyboard or banging my head against the laptop monitor as a writer, uh, I acquire books for Flux, a young adult fiction imprint right here in the Twin Cities. And in my professional capacity as an editor, as someone who works in the publishing field, I feel highly qualified to objectively say that Minnesota plays home to some of the most talented writers working today. From novels to memoirs to poetry, our state hoards an embarrassment of riches. But in my capacity as a writer, a position that fills me with unlimited bias, <laughs> I find it hard to name a group of writers more generous, more welcoming, and more supportive than the Minnesotans who write for young people. They say that writing is a solitary endeavor. Well, somebody forgot to tell that to the, the young people's writers. Um, got a question about craft, trying to work through a tricky plot twist, need to know the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow. These writers have got your back. And I know for a fact that the four finalists in this category, in addition to being extraordinary writers, are also outstanding examples of that kinship. The finalists are Goblin Secrets by William Alexander, published by Margaret K. McEldery Books, Simon & Schuster, Inc. Nothing Special by Jeff Herbach, published by Sourcebooks Fire, Sourcebooks, Inc. Shadow on the Mountain by Margie Preuss, published by Amulet Books, Abrams. And Silhouette of a Sparrow by Molly Beth Griffin, published by Milkweed Editions. And the award goes to Jeff Herbach, nothing special. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, if you know about my books at all, I, and I tell this story a lot, that, that my son grew over the course of, of four months uh, about six inches. Um, and I, I wasn't going to write any more books uh, before that happened. Uh, but I thought, uh, and I was out of town when it happened, and I, he, I got home and he was a, a completely different human being. Uh, and his voice, you know, when he left, when I left, he'd say, hi, Dad. Uh, and by the time I got back, he was like, hey, man, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it, the day that I started writing uh, uh, the series that Nothing Special is part of, he came downstairs um, and, and he, he said, do you smell something, Dad? And uh, I went, yeah, what is that? And we, we, we went around the house sniffing as, as you do when something smells off. Uh, as I passed him, uh, I thought, oh my God, it's you. And he's like, what? <laughs> Awful. 
But we, we went to Target and had a real nice uh, father-son deodorant purchase. Uh, that was lovely. Uh, <laughs> so I started, I started writing a, a, a book aimed at kids like him. But th that's the funny part. The, the not funny part is that he, at the same moment, uh, he started to smell funny in just his left armpit at that time. <laughs> only, only his left armpit went, went through puberty overnight. Um, he also stopped reading. Uh, he, he, was a, he was a fierce reader of fantasy. Um, and at, at the time he grew that much and started smelling funky, he stopped reading and it scared me because I teach college. And, and when I, boys don't read, they show up at college and they can't write a paper, they can't think. And I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do? We have to read books, yeah. So I, I, wrote, I wrote the book for him uh, and for his friends who stopped reading. And, and I am so happy that, that you, you have recognized the, these books for, for readers who don't want to read, exactly. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the, the St. Paul, Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Um, thanks to my wife, Stephanie Wilbur Ash, whom I love so much. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, I get called a Wisconsin writer a lot, primarily by Wisconsinites. Uh, but I, I want to say here tonight that if it weren't for the loft, if it weren't for Hamlin University, if it weren't for Minnesota State Mankato, I would not be a writer. I am a Minnesotan. Thank you so much. Can I pop one? Now I'm paranoid about my underarm odor. Um, <laughs> next, the K. Sexton Award. We're here celebrating tonight not just the great writers who call Minnesota home, but we're going to honor someone who was not only a writer, but a person who helped foster emerging and established artists, championing the work of many here and many more across the country. The K. Sexton Award, sponsored by Common Good Books, is a special award bestowed on an individual or organization for outstanding contributions to Minnesota's literary community. The award is named for K. Sexton, a career bookseller and dedicated arts advocate. Introducing the honoree with a special video tribute is James P. Lenfesti, acclaimed poet and writer author of the essays The Urban Cowboy and the poetry collections Earth in Anger and a Cartload of Scrolls, among others. James P. Thanks for the acclaimed, Lerma. <laughs> I couldn't be more pleased uh, to join in this tribute to my good friend Robert Hedin. Please turn your attention to the screens for a brief look at his exceptional literary life. Well, when I think about the K. Sexton Award, an award that honors dedication and outstanding work in fostering books and reading and literary activity in Minnesota, his contributions immediately come to mind because here is a man who's founded and fostered one of the most significant literary treasures of our state, the Anderson Center in Red Wing, Minnesota, a place where writers at every stage of their career are given the gifts of time and space in order to devote their full attention to their work. In addition to the Anderson Center, Robert's given generously to other writers in this state, both as the editor of the Great River Review and the comprehensive poetry anthology, Where One Voice Ends, Another Begins. Robert has made real his commitment to advancing and celebrating the work of Minnesota writers, past and present, and making sure their voices are honored in his time. In the Anderson Center, Robert has created a place for writers to think and read and dream and create former residents from across the state, writers merging and established writers, writers of poetry and picture books, all of them will tell you that the Anderson Center has made a difference in their lives. One of the things that distinguishes a residency at the Anderson Center is Robert's knowledge as a poet of what other artists need to create. And Robert is extremely respectful 
of providing people the space and the room to do that. And there's just a real generosity of spirit that comes with him being excited about uh, other people's success. I really admire the way Robert takes the long view of what's possible. Uh, to listen to him talk about his vision for the Anderson Center and then to watch him go out and build the support to achieve that has just been remarkable. Among the details that make the Anderson Center so superb for literary artists is the environment. I don't just mean the Cannon River Gorge, which is right outside the windows, but rather, in, or in addition, the sculpture garden and the prairie, which Robert has lovingly restored, and it's an absolutely beautiful place and utterly inspiring. Robert is a very humble man, and as he takes residents around to show them the facility, he says nothing about his role in making this happen. But I have to say, this last October, he was positively glowing because they just finished the barn, which is a marvelous performance and reading space, the last piece of the puzzle to make the Anderson Center perfect. And one could sense how pleased he was. And as a writer in Minnesota, I couldn't be more pleased to have a chance to be able to go down there and, and experience that change in Robert and in our state. When I think of Robert, I always think of him walking the grounds of the Anderson Center, a kind of benevolent, gracious spirit, an image of goodwill. And there I am watching him from my window, taking a short break from my work to glimpse him at the turtle pond or listen to him laugh with a work crew or get back to tending the next big thing that must be done. Robert's always at work and so am I. And I get back to my writing, grateful for the land and the house that made such a moment possible and grateful especially for the generosity of Robert, who that very afternoon will undoubtedly be in his office arranging the book festival in September, or editing another writer's poetry, or waiting for the plumber to tell him why our dishwasher won't start. All of that while I'm left upstairs in perfect peace to write my story, which is exactly the dream that Robert had in mind. So, Robert Hedin, on behalf of Common Good Books, the Minnesota Book Awards, and the entire Minnesota literary artist community, it is my honor to present to you the K. Sexton Award. Thank you so much. It's not often that you may see a 64-year-old man break down. <laughs> this is indeed an honor, and I wish to express my deep gratitude to all of you, and especially to the friends of the St. Paul Library. It may be hard to believe, given this evening's wonderful festivities, that a little more than a half century ago, Minnesota was regarded by many as a literary backwater. Most of the writers at that time fled the state for what they felt to be greener literary pastures elsewhere. Some went to New York, others to Chicago, San Francisco, and unfortunately, few, if, ever, if any, ever returned. And yet, as we all know today, the literary culture in Minnesota is alive and well. The envy of every state in the Midwest, and without question, one of the most vibrant, dynamic book communities in the entire nation. And this, of course, is due to the hard work and overall commitment of our state's many extraordinary writers, publishers, 
bookstores, libraries, readers, literary organizations, and magnanimous funding agencies. All have come together to create a thriving literary community bound, it seems to me, by one common thread. The undeniable conviction that writers enrich the composition of life in this state, and that through their writings we are offered insights into who we are, where we have come from, of our common values and aspirations. Over the years, serving as consultant for various arts boards and literary groups around the country, I would often hear someone propose an idea to push their organization forward. And without fail, this would be followed by a pause. And then someone would pipe up, break the silence, and simply say, well, before we do anything, let's first see how they do it in Minnesota. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. You make me proud to be a Minnesotan. And common good books, I just have to relay this little story. I heard Garrison Keillor uh, lecture about a year ago, and he was talking about a young man who was severely facially pierced. He had so many piercings on his face, Garrison said. He looked like he had fallen headfirst into a tackle box. Um, <laughs> thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> book, 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 book. This category is sponsored by Wellington Management Incorporated, a real estate investment development and property management company that takes a long-term view of their investments and relationships. Those investments total 4 million square feet throughout the seven-county metro area. So please join me in thanking Wellington Management. And presenting the award for poetry is two-time book award winner for You Won't Remember This and Selected Poems, 1965 to 1995, Michael Dennis Brown. Book. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here to support my fellow poets. And there are many beloved writers here. And I'm sure we're all mindful of the writers who cannot be here or who have moved on, who's, who constitute the invisible community that we feel sustained by. I also want to thank all the sponsors for the great work they've done. I was allotted 60 seconds to talk about poetry, and I thought instead I would simply say you a poem I love, which exemplifies um, the qualities I might have talked about in poetry, not one of my own. It's by Marge Piercy, a living poet. It's called To Be of Use. The people I love the best jump into work head first without dallying in the shadows and swim off with sure strokes, almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, the black sleek heads of seals bouncing like half-submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves, an ox to a heavy cart, who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done, again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud, botched, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust. 
But the thing worth doing, well done, has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn, are put in museums. But you know they were meant to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry, and a person for work that is real. This year's finalists in poetry are The First Day of Spring in Northern Minnesota by Jim Johnson, published by Red Dragonfly Press. Odessa by Patricia Kirkpatrick, published by Milkweed Editions. Pitch by Todd Boss, published by W.W. W. Norton and Company. And Salt Pier by Dor Kieselbach, published by University of Pittsburgh Press. And the Poetry Award goes to Patricia Kirkpatrick Odessa. Thank you. Um, my thank you and congratulations to my colleagues, Dor Kesselbach, Todd Boss, and Jim Johnson, fine poets all. I'm sitting at two tables tonight. One is the St. Paul Almanac, which not only publishes an almanac every year, but gives people of all ages and genders and ethnicities the chance to both edit and see their work be published. I'm also sitting at the Milkweed Editions table, and I have been nothing but honored by their professionalism and kindness and dedication to the written world. I was recently on a panel in Boston with some very fancy writers, and one of them said, the, the editor every writer wants to have, Allison Wigan, and so thank you, Allison. I also want to thank, of course, Lindquist and Venom and Richard Irig, who had the idea to uh, support a poetry prize. Um, doesn't happen very often, and it's nice when it does. Um, there are many people uh, to be thanked in my book, and I'll make you a deal. If you'll buy the book, I won't name them all. <laughs> or else buy a book of poetry, because your boyfriend and your neighbor and your kids are going to be so impressed if you come home with a book of poetry. <laughs> They're really going to think. <laughs> I moved to Minnesota 40 years ago when I graduated from college at the University of Iowa because this is where I understood the writers were. People like Michael Dennis Brown, Thomas McGrath, uh, Robert Bly, Carol Bly, Patricia Hampel, Jim Moore, Lewis Jenkins. Um, and they were here. And then I went away to San Francisco for 10 years, and when I came back, it seemed like for five years I answered, why did you move to Minnesota from San Francisco? And I was sitting at a meeting with a, a foundation president one day, and he, of course, asked that question too. And I told him why I moved to St. To, uh, Paul, and he said, well, we're the sixth, I can't vouch for his numbers now, but at the time he said, uh, we're the 16th largest population in America, and we're the eighth largest book buying public. So I think that sums it up. This is where the writers are, and this is where the readers are. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Patricia. I love when a poet is also a good business person. So, The next award is for children's literature. 
And this award is sponsored by Books for Africa, the world's largest shipper of donated text and library books to the African continent. Based in St. Paul, BFA is celebrating its 25th year of working to end the book famine in Africa. Since 1988, a very auspicious year, BFA has shipped over 28 million books to 49 African countries, including 2.2 million books valued at $30 million this year alone, or last year. This year, it's 40 million. Let's give a warm round of applause to Books for Africa and its director, Pat Plonsky. Among them, the honorees in children's literature category have had many, many, many finalist nominations and five previous wins. Presenting the award is Deborah Frazier, a 1999 winner for Out of the Ocean. Hello. Somewhere, someday, a careful graduate student will ponder this question. Why does the state of Minnesota produce a disproportionate amount of the finest children's books published in the United States year after year? This academic will ask, is it because of the large array of organizations that support writers, from classes to speakers to breakfast to publishers to bookstores to grants? Or is it because of its fine library system? Or is it the outstanding educators who carry our books for young people forward? Or if they have visited here, they might propose that it is the long stretch of dark, cold days <laughs> stretching endlessly into April. <laughs> Perfect conditions for sitting at one's desk writing or illustrating. But I hope this academic will also propose this answer. Maybe it is their peers. Maybe they inspire each other. And with every book made by the astonishing array of talent here, the bar is raised for all of the authors and illustrators in this state. If our nominees were dropped into separate states in our far-flung union, each one would win that state's top award. But because they were nominated in the state that produces more fine children's per books per capita than any other, only one will carry the official Minnesota Book Award. What I want to remind the nominees is that the real award is that their efforts are building libraries of such quality far beyond Minnesota's borders. Tonight will fade from our memories, but meanwhile, it will be all the books on this list this year that are carried in backpacks, read at bedtime, and cycled through libraries for years to come until the pages are worn and the covers are tattered. That tattered cover will be the true award for all your efforts this year. The nominees for the children's picture book are A Leaf Can Be by Laura Purdy Salas, illustrated by Violetta Dabiha, published by Mill Book Press, Lerner Publishing Group. It's a Tiger by David La Rochelle, illustrated by Jeremy Tankard and published by Chronicle Books. Tell Me About Your Day Today by Mem Fox, illustrated by Lauren Stringer and published by Beach Lane Books, Simon and & Schuster, and Waking Dragons by Jane Yolen, illustrated by Derek Anderson, published by Simon & Schuster Books for Young Readers, Simon & Schuster. And the award goes to David La Rochelle for It's a Tiger.
I so agree with Deborah. I feel so very, very fortunate to live in a state with such a strong children's literature community filled with such talented authors and illustrators as Lauren Stringer, Laura Purdy Salas, Derek Anderson, Deborah Fraser, and so many other people. Um, I feel also very, very fortunate that my editor chose Jeremy Tankard to illustrate my book. Uh, a picture book without pictures is pretty dull indeed. <laughs> and Jeremy took my simple 350 words and turned them into a beautiful book. Thank you, Jeremy. And I feel very fortunate to have uh, such a good friend, Gary Nygaard, <laughs> uh, who is always supportive of, of all of my books and all of my writing. And tonight I feel very fortunate to accept this honor. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next award of the evening is the General Nonfiction Category, sponsored by Minnesota AFL-CIO. Yeah. The State Federation of Labor representing over 300,000 members in over 1,000 local unions throughout Minnesota with a mission to improve the lives of working families. Please join me in recognizing Minnesota AFL-CIO. Union, yeah. We have four distinguished authors who are new to this awards category. Presenting the award is the 2012 General Nonfiction winner for Fool Me Twice, Fighting the Assault on Science in America, Sean Lawrence Otto. Thank you, Lorna. Book, 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 book. So uh, I want to start by apologizing for the kind of rough look of my face. Uh, it's healing now, but I actually injured it researching my next general nonfiction book, The Joys and Sorrows of Hunting with Dick Cheney. <laughs> Writers of nonfiction, of general nonfiction, do that sort of thing. It takes dedication and commitment. It takes getting out there and talking to people that you might not otherwise talk to. And it takes sorting through a myriad of seemingly unrelated and confusing facts to find those special nuggets of story to string together into a pearl necklace of narrative to share with all the rest of us and show us the beauty of the stories that exist all around us every day. So the winners or the uh, nominees tonight in this terrific category are Debating the End of History, The Marketplace, Utopia, and the Fragmentation of Intellectual Life by David W. Noble, published by University of Minnesota Press. Forward, The First American Unsupported Expedition to the North Pole, by John Houston and Tyler Fish, published by Octane Press. Holding Our World Together, Ojibwe Women and the Survival of Community, by Brenda J. Child, published by Viking Penguin Group. And finally, Res Life, An Indian's Journey Through Reservation Life, by David Troyer, published by Atlantic Monthly Press, Grove, and Atlantic, Inc. And the winner is David Troyer. Dear gathered people, <laughs> I am David Troyer. As you can see, living and teaching in California has had a few unintended side effects. I am strangely taller, more handsome, and better dressed than before. 
In short, over the past two years, I have come to resemble Josh Ostergaard, a member of Team Grey Wolf Press here in Minneapolis. This resemblance can be only a good thing. I am deeply honored that you have seen fit to award ResLife the Minnesota Book Award for Nonfiction. ResLife was my first awkward step into nonfiction, and when we sold the thing back in 2005, I had no idea how hard the writing of it would prove to be. They say, write what you know, but perhaps that should be amended to, write what you think you know, and by the time you're done, the only thing you'll know is that you didn't know anything when you began. <laughs> but an even better directive might be, write what you love. That is, in the end, what I did. I tried to write a book that reached across the whole of the continent, but I kept coming back to the people and places of Minnesota and Wisconsin, to what is the homeland. So I am greatly touched and humbled by this award. It means the world to me. Thank you. Have a great night, David Troyer. <laughs> P.S. I will be out of cell phone and email range till late on Sunday. <laughs> so silence on my end is not uh, for lack of enthusiasm. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yes, you might want that. Um, so, Sean, I didn't know you were working on a book with Dick Cheney. I myself am uh, I'm going into the world of nonfiction, and I'll be uh, writing the copy for uh, the George Bush illustrated shower painting book. Um, <laughs> it's really good. Maybe I'll see you here next year. Okay. Now we are pleased to honor a Minnesota book artist for her excellence and contributions to Minnesota book arts community with the Book Artist Award, sponsored by Lerner Publishing Group and presented with Minnesota Center for Book Arts. Early in its history, MCBA was housed at Lerner Publishing, keep popping, and the sponsorship of the Book Artist Award continues a long tradition and interest in book arts on the part of Lerner Publishing Group. Here to make tonight's presentation are Bridget O'Malley and Amanda Degner of Cave Paper, winner of the Book Award Artist Award in 2012. Thank you. Um, we are very pleased to present this award to Jana. I've known her for 20 years. We first met down at the University of Iowa. This is definitely worth celebrating. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> I got one for her. I've been in awe of Jana's artistry for, for all these years. And I would say with, uh, with great pride that in her case, you definitely can judge a book by its cover. Uh -huh. Good point. Uh, Jana shares her vast knowledge without hesitation to all book artists. She walks around the Minnesota Center for Book Arts and she sort of checks out what, every, checks out what everybody's <laughs> making. But more importantly, she really cares about artists and following their work. Her um, role as an educator, she's extremely supportive. And she has so many skills in binding, in letterpress printing that she does collaboratively, collaboratively and she's a really good hand paper maker too. <laughs> and I think just looking at the screen and seeing her work will show you what an incredible craftsperson Jana Pullman is. So let's look at her work. Jana is a central figure in our community, a true Renaissance woman skilled in papermaking, binding, printing, and graphic design. Moreover, she has a willingness to generously share her knowledge and craft with all. She has great patience with new learners and a wealth of knowledge that she brings to other master artists. Jana gives so much to the book arts community, not only as an instructor, but also as a friend and mentor to countless students. It's hard for me to separate Jana from her work because 
her work defines her, and that's really unique that when you see the work, you might not picture Jana, but once you get to know Jana, you can imagine that the work is going to be surprisingly mysterious in, in its beauty with exquisite details that are, that are unexpected and also in the same way that her personality is, is very modest, her work is modest and sometimes you don't discover things until you look at it a second or third time really closely. I think she's incredibly skilled technically and also has a really good ability to keep herself developing and learning new skills and perfecting on skills, some of which she's invented herself. The contributions to the community are just sharing information and as well as putting beautiful work out there. That's a contribution to the society visually and conceptually. Jana represents the best in book art practice today. Her designer bindings evolve from a study of and respect for the history of book binding and how those ancient book structures can be used, reinterpreted, and revitalized by today's artists. Her exceptional craft skills combine with a deep understanding of the book as an expressive vehicle to create bindings that personify the art in book art. Jana's work responds to a book's content, and then through that response, her creative voice carries her sense of the life held within that book out onto its covers, and so out into the world for all of us, every book lover, to revel in. Jana is generous in all things, and we're so lucky to have her in Minnesota's book community. On behalf of the Learner Publishing Group, the Minnesota Book Awards, and the Minnesota Center for Book Arts, I would like to present the 2013 Book Arts Award to Jana Pullman. Oh, how wonderful to also get a beautiful piece of art. Um, needless to say, books are my passion, some may say obsession, and uh, to be honored for doing something that I love is truly wonderful. And uh, I want to thank the friends of the St. Paul Public Library and uh, Learner Publishing Group for recognizing the artists and the wonderful work that happens here. Um, I've been supported throughout the years by many people. And first, I would like to thank my wife, Catherine Lendoff, for supporting me. <laughs> she first met me when I was a paper maker, something that uh, probably no one really thought people did for a living. And uh, <laughs> still, she thought there might be some potential with this one. Um, and um, she's seen me grow and move throughout the field and expand and has been there to champion and occasionally push me a little harder. No, get out there and try it. And um, I also want to thank the uh, Minnesota Center for Book. It's really the reason I came to Minnesota back in 1997, because I knew there would be a community here. I knew there would be support in the book arts. And I am pleased to also, because of that experience, also be able to know quite a few writers in this state and to see what a wonderful um, community we do have. So I'd like to thank those people, the many instructors and the many colleagues and the many writers who have inspired me. Because when I work on one of these bindings, the first thing I do is I have to read the book. I want to know what the writer's intent was so I can support that. So it's my love of books that continues to push me forward. So I thank you very much.
There are so many interesting people in this room, I can't believe it. Um, and Jana, you did say book eight times in your speech, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now we're getting to the Memoir and Creative Nonfiction Award. This year we have three debut memoirs and a posthumous work from a multiple award winner. The category is sponsored by Leonard Street and Dinard, a law firm that can trace its Minnesota roots back to 1922. Here's what they have to say. As the firm proudly celebrates its 91st year of helping clients achieve their legal and business goals, we are very pleased this evening to help sponsor the creative achievements of Minnesota's talented authors. We congratulate all the nominees and are reminded tonight of how fortunate we are to live and work in a state enriched with imagination, intelligence, and industry. Well said. Let's recognize Leonard Street and Dinard. And tonight's presenter is Nancy Paddock, last year's winner for A Song at Twilight of Alzheimer's and Love. Nancy Paddock. Well, it's wonderful and scary to stand up here and talk to you all. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to have to read what I have to say here. Um, memoir and creative nonfiction are grouped into one award category, and there are good reasons for this, because they both use literary styles and techniques to create a factually accurate, we hope, uh, narrative enhanced by qualities of the imagination. And so um, I've thought about that as a as a definition, I thought, well, how do you get a factually er you know, accurate narrative? And I thought, hmm, journals. I suppose many of you keep journals. I've kept a journal ever since my mother gave me this little one that you're supposed to write three lines <laughs> each day, and it's supposed to last five years. <laughs> no. <laughs> But anyway, I have stacks of these things, and, and I sort of feel like it's toxic waste, and, and I'm going to have to figure out something to do with them besides leave them. Well, anyway, um, so journals. I think about a journal as a trusted, impossibly tolerant friend that w does not judge you or interrupt you but listens with infinite patience while you complain, solve problems, recount dreams, and even have some inspired discoveries, or just dump off the tangle and burden of each day so you can start fresh. The results can be the first drafts of literature once in a while, and that might range from poetry to memoir and creative nonfiction. And tonight we're celebrating, and this is a great honor, some of the year's treasures in several genres. But with that honor comes the difficulty of selecting just one. And I think that's been a difficulty all night, isn't it? You know, you just see all of these wonderful, wonderful books. The finalists for the Minnesota Book Award in Memoir and Creative Nonfiction are Letters to a Young Madman by Paul Gruco. This is published by Levin's Publishing. Life on Ice, 25 Years of Arctic Exploration by Delani Dupree, published by Keene Editions. My Mother is Now Earth by Mark Anthony Rollo, published by Borealis Books, Minnesota Historical Society Press, and Turn Here Sweet Corn, Organic Farming Works by Atina Diffley, published by University of Minnesota Press. And the winner of the award is, and I can't wait to find out, Atina Diffley. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, I've never had this experience before. <laughs> um, but most of what I wrote about in Turn Here Sweet Corn, I never had the experience before it happened. And um, when I started writing it, I was an organic farmer and a mother and a wife. And I was a journalist, as Nancy said, was really crucial to the writing. But I had never published anything longer than a newspaper article. Um, and I was terrified. So I did what any smart writer would do, which is I went to the loft. And I really wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the loft. There was incredible teachers there. Um, I'm often asked why I named Turn Here Sweet Corn, um, Turn Here Sweet Corn, and I was driving down the road, down Highway 3, uh, looking for food and farming, which is what I wanted in my life, and there was this sign, Turn Here Sweet Corn, and I just whoop right in that driveway. It was a little bit like, uh, like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was out of the car before it even stopped rolling. It was all there, the bright red flesh of tomatoes and that scent of fresh basil, everything Minnesota sweet corn, and a very, very handsome farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Who I also wouldn't be standing here tonight if it wasn't for you, Martin. Thank you so much for all you have been in my life. And I have to say, I don't think there's been a farmer in Minnesota who's been better supported than I have uh, by our customers by our, for our business. And then also um, when we had a legal um, intervention with the Koch brothers over an eminent domain issue on a pipeline. <laughs> 4,500 of our customers wrote letters to the judge. <sighs> And the first time I called our attorney, Paula Maccabee, she said, Gardens Vegan Organic Farm? Crude oil pipeline? This is gonna be fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I have had help from um, so many people, and I wanna thank tonight in particular Beth Dooley, who's been a fairy godmother for me as a writer. Carrie Jennings and Esther Ure and Roger Blobaum, who really were my support. And my kids, um, Maze and Eliza, and my grandkids, and all you Minnesota readers, so thank you. Altina, your table also wins Best Enthusiasm Award. <laughs> woo! Woo! Can we get a collective woo? Woo! Oh, that was good. That was good. How's everybody doing? Great. We only have four more hours. So, yeah. This really has been fun to hear everybody. Um, we're going to close out the evening with the Genre Fiction Award. You can look around the room and see that it's studded with previous book award finalists and winners, and perhaps for the first time, someone who is competing against himself. <laughs> That's true in this category. And tonight's category is sponsored by Marvin Windows and Doors, a premier manufacturer of made-to-order wood and clad wood windows and doors. Marvin's tradition of delivering the finest craftsmanship in windows and doors began in War Road, Minnesota, where the privately held, family-owned and operated company is still headquartered today and now is in its fourth generation. Please recognize Marvin Windows and Doors and their representative, Christine Marvin. And I have been up in your library, and it is beautiful. So now join me in welcoming the author of Big Wheat, last year's winner in this category, Richard A. Thompson. Thank you all. 
Uh, over the years, I have uh, listened to and sometimes participated in uh, many discussions about the distinction between genre fiction and serious literature. <laughs> and the conclusion is almost invariably that when the quality of writing reaches a certain level, there is no distinction. And you are just as liable to find the truth of your soul on Raymond Chandler's mean streets as on Virginia Woolf's lighthouse. <laughs> So tonight we have four fine examples of uh, that premise, and as so often the case here, it's a real shame that only one of them can win. Uh, the finalists are The Curse of the Jade Lily by David Housewright, published by Minotaur uh, Books, St. Martin's Press. The Devil and the Diva by David Housewright and Rene Valois, published by Down and Out Books. Ruth 3-5 by Michael Fridgen published by Dreamily Books, and finally, The Tudor's Daughter by Julie Clausen, published by Bethany House, Baker Publishing Group. And the award for genre fiction goes to, I don't want that one. If I can get it open, David Housewright, The Curse of the Jade Lily. <laughs> I'm really happy about this. Um, <laughs> I really am. And I appreciate it very much, but I'd be a damn sight happier if you'd given it to me for Devil and the Diva, which I wrote with my wife, Renee Valois. <laughs> and not just because of what promises to be an awkward drive home. Um, <laughs> oh. All of the writers who have been here tonight, uh, either on the stage or in the audience, all the writers who are at home, we all have one thing in common, and that is we work alone. We might have very elaborate infrastructures for support, writers groups, editors, but we work alone. Whether it's at uh, booth number five at the St. Clair Broiler in your dark, dank basement office beneath a flickering 80 or 60 watt light bulb. Okay, it's fluorescent, but it's still a dark, dank basement office. Um, but Renee is the reason I've never been alone. So, uh, well, the friends didn't give her this award, I think I will give her mine. Thank you very much. What a nice husband. <laughs> During their seven years of running the Book Awards, the Friends has relied on a strong partnership with libraries around the state, especially the St. Paul Public Library. And here to close the evening is its director. Please welcome Kit Hadley. Tonight has been our wonderful annual love fest for our authors, publishers, illustrators, and of course, readers. Mary Ann Grossman's wonderful article and tonight's program describe the many people to whom we are grateful that this special event is thriving. I can't help but call out, however, with big appreciation the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, under whose care these last seven years, the awards have really blossomed. We would like to thank our statewide library partners, the Council of Regional Public Library System Administrators, the Minnesota State Library Agency, MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, 
MEMO, Minnesota Educational Media Organization, and the Minnesota Library Foundation. Please give special thanks to the Minnesota Book Awards director, Elaine Hopkins. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you.